Hello friends, in this video we will be continuing with the discussion of the electrical engineering paper 1 of the engineering service exam 2009. We will start our discussion with the question number 6. The previous 5 questions have been discussed in the previous video. Now, in the sixth question, they have asked us find the voltage. We have given the circuit and they have asked us to find the voltage at node A. This is node A with respect to zero for the circuit as shown. This is the zero. So, what they have given us over here is two current sources. Now, moving on to the solution. Now, the first procedure in order to solve this question is to understand that we have been given two current sources and now we will con convert these two current sources into equivalent voltage sources. We so, this 20 ampere current source and this 2 ohm resistor will combine to form this 40 volt voltage source. And its source imprints would be <coughs> this 2 ohm resistor. So in a similar manner, we will be applying the same methods for this 10 ampere current source. So this 10 ampere current source in parallel with its uh, source imprints of 1 ohm would be replaced by this 10 volt voltage source in series with the uh, source imprints of 1 ohm. So, those calculations have been shown over here and over here we can see that the voltage VAO would be represented at this point and now the next step would be to find the current in this circuit. Now, one thing we have to note in particular is the polarity of these two voltage sources that we have written. So, according to the direction of current, we have look we have given a polarity for these voltage sources and now the next step we'll go on to finding the current and the current would be nothing but the voltage divided by the resistance the voltage is nothing but 40 volts plus 10 volts the polarity is being adding up and the total resistance is 2 plus 2 plus 1 and we will get a current of 10 amperes now, in order to find the voltage this VA0, we can subtract the voltage drop across this 2 ohm resistor from this 40 volt and find out the voltage VA0. So, VA0 is equal to 40 volts minus the current into 2 ohm resistor and it gives us the value of 20 volts. And if we were to check the option the answer would be B we'll just check the options and we have the option B over here which is nothing but 20 volts now we'll move on to the seventh question and in the seventh question they have asked us to match list to one with the list to two and to select the answer using the codes and in the list one they have given us the type of instrument and they have given us in the list two the example so we have indicating absolute recording integrating types of instruments and examples have been given as watt meter tangent galvanometer aneroid barometer and energy meter now moving on to the solution of this question now if we were to see an indicating kind of instrument the example would be uh, or, or watt meter it indicates the average power in the normal case and if we were to see look for an example of an absolute type instrument it would be a tangent galvanometer 
Now in a tangent galvanometer, it measures the current by comparison of the magnetic field produced by the uh, current to be measured with the magnetic field of the earth. So the basic principle of an absolute instrument is that it uh, does the measurement by comparison with some other quantity. So now we, if we look for an example of a recording type uh, instrument, our uh, the answer would be an anaerobic barometer and in recording uh, instruments what we get is a record of the measurement, measurement or the measured variable versus time. So we get a continuous record of that. And next would be the integrating kind of instruments. And the example is energy meter. Now energy is nothing but the integral of the uh, power with respect to time over time. Over time when the power is integrated we get energy. So if we were to look at the options the answer would be A and uh, you can see over here this would be our answer this option A. Moving to the eighth question they have given us a mechanical system equivalence equivalent diagram and they have asked us which of the following is the correct free body diagram for the physical system as shown in the figure above. Now this is a mechanical translational system. There can also be mechanical rotational systems and these two represent the spring M1 and M2 represent mass and this F1 and F2 represent dashboard. Dashboard is nothing but which provides friction. Now these masses are rolling over uh, rollers so the friction is zero over there. The masses have been assigned displacement Y1 and velocity V1 for M1 mass and for the mass M2 they have assigned a displacement of Y2 and a velocity of V2. Now if we were to analyze this mechanical translational system M1 if we were to analyze the the mass M1 now it has a displacement of y1 and velocity v1 and when this mass is subject to a displacement y1 the spring also gets extended the spring constant is k1 so when the spring gets extended it will exert a force in the opposite direction and that has, that is what has been shown over here and that force would be given by the value k1 into y1 the force the opposite for opposing force given by the spring would be nothing but the spring constant that is k1 multiplied by the displacement of the spring extension of the spring that is y1 now in a similar manner if we were to see the force exerted by this dashboard the force exerted by the dashboard opposing the force that is applied over this mass and the displacement of this mass would be nothing but F1 into the derivative of the displacement. The derivative of the displacement is nothing but the velocity. So that is what has been shown over here. So these two forces oppose the uh, motion of m1 in the direction y1 so and if you were to see the other two forces associated with these two elements the spring k2 and the dashboard f2 now if the if the displacement y2 is in fact uh, if it is greater this displacement y2 is the displacement of the mass m2 now if the displacement y2 is greater than displacement y1 we can see that the spring is in fact 
extended is in, in this direction in this direction the the spring is extended so this force would be applied on this mass m1 also and that force is given by k2 into the k2 into the difference of the displacement on the two ends of the spring that is nothing but y2 minus y1 the two ends of the spring are subject to dip two different displacements and that is what has been shown over here now the dashboard also can be analyzed in a similar manner uh, the only difference being that here we'll take the derivative of the displacements and so the force would be f2 into y2 dash minus y1 dash y2 dash representing the derivative of the displacement of displacement y2 now if we were to analyze the force m2 now the force f is applied on this mass m2 and the the two forces are so produced by the spring and the dashboard oppose this force and this forces are given by for given by for the spring k2 into y2 minus y1 which is nothing but the difference in displacement on the two ends of the spring and in a similar manner the force exerted by the dashboard is given by f2 into y2 dash minus y1 dash now one thing we have to note is that the i have shown over here this does not represent any kind of force but just the displacement and the corresponding velocity that is why i have over here put a circle over there the actual force is acting on this on these bodies m2 and m1 has been shown by corresponding arrows so if we were to analyze the options the this would be the correct option the option a we have all four options over here and the option correct option would be the option a let us now discuss the ninth question and in the ninth question they have asked in a fluid flow system two fluids are mixed in appropriate proportions the concentration at the mixing point is y of t and it is reproduced without change td seconds later at the monitoring point as b of t what is the transfer function between b of t and y of t and they have given us several options four options they have given us uh, we will now analyze this question and try to find out the solution now the input concentration is here defined as y of t and the output concentration is defined as b of t now they, they have told us that it is re, reproduce exactly the output is nothing but a reproduction of the input except that there is a time delay td and what they have asked us in the question is the transfer function between the output and the input b of s divided by y of s now i have drawn over here a diagram showing the output and the input it is an ex simple example of how two signals may be time delayed now over here i have shown the input y of t this is the signal y of t and this is the output b of t and the b of t is nothing but displaced y of t by a time delay td and in such a case we can write this b of t as y of t minus td minus u of t minus td now this u of t as as you may know is the unit step function delayed by a time delay td now we can take the laplace transform of this uh, b of t so this is the laplace transform b of s and we take the its laplace uh, to get it we can take the laplace transform of b of t and the laplace transform would be nothing but b of t into integral 0 to infinity 
into b of t e to the power minus s t dt. Now this expression for b of t can be substituted over here and we get this expression the integral 0 to infinity y of t minus t d u of t minus t d dt e to the power minus s t. Now we make a substitution t minus t d equal to k and based on this substitution we will have some other substitutions also one being that t is equal to k plus t d we can derive these things from over here and the limits as t tends to 0 the k, or k would tend to minus t d and as t tends to infinity the k tends to also infinity and dt also equal to d of k. Now we make all these substitutions in this integral over here in this integral and in that now we come to the expression defining b of s as the integral from minus td to infinity based on the substitution of these limits y of k u of k e to the power minus s k into e to the power minus s into t d d k. Now this is a constant term e to the power minus s into t d. So that can be taken outside this integral and one thing we have to remember is that this u of k, the function u of k over here is equal to 0 for k less than 0 and it is equal to 1 for k greater than or equal to 1. This is the basic definition of a unit step function. So in such a case this this integral from minus td to 0 would be its value would be nothing but 0 and so we can change its limit to 0 and the the value of u of k in the limit 0 to infinity is nothing but 1 so we can re replace it with 1 so finally we end up with such a kind of integral integral 0 to infinity y of k e to the power minus s k d k now this is this is nothing but the definition of the Laplace transform of y, the signal y of k. So we can write over here e to the power minus s into td into y of s and from this we can derive the transfer function b of s divided by y of s and we get over here the transfer function e to the power minus s into td. Now the we can analyze our options and over here we have e to the power minus td into s and the option correct option is the option c now we'll see the tenth question and the tenth question is the strain gauge with a resistance of 250 ohm undergoes a change of 0.15 ohm during a test, the strain is 1.5 into 10 to the power minus 4. What is the gauge factor? Now, in order to find the solution, the given data in this question is the resistance 250 ohm of the strain gauge, the change delta R, which is 0.15 ohm, and the strain which is nothing but the change in length divided by the original length so that is 1.5 into 10 to the power minus 4 and they have asked us what is the gauge factor now the gauge factor or the sensitivity factor of a strain gauge is defined as the per unit change in resistance divided by the strain or the per unit length so that is the expression for the gauge factor and we can substitute the given data into this formula and so that would be nothing but the change in resistance is nothing but 0.15 ohm divided by the resistance 250 ohm yeah, divided by the uh, strain which is nothing but 1.5 into 10 to the power minus 4 so from this formula we get the value of gain factor as 4 and if you were to analyze the options the answer 4 is corresponds to the option B and so option B is the correct option.
we'll now move on to the 11th question and in the 11th question they have asked us for the AC circuit shown as above if the RMS voltage across the resistor is 120 volt what is the value of the inductor so they have given us a series RL circuit given us the voltage and has asked us to find the voltage across has, and has also given us the voltage across the resistor and they want us to find the value of L to find the solution for this question we have again drawn this circuit over here and the from the given data itself we will be able to find that the omega the frequency of the circuit is 500 radians per second the expression for voltage is given so in that it is given as 150 root 2 uh, sin 500 t so omega is equal to 500 radians per second so the RMS voltage of the voltage source is 150 volts and if we were to find out the current through the circuit the voltage across the resistor is already given that is 120 volts and if we were to divide it by the resistance 1 kilo ohm we will get the current through the circuit as 120 milliamperes. Now we will just see the phasor diagram of the circuit. I have drawn over here the applied voltage of the source that is 150 volt and the since this is a RL circuit the current I which is 120 milliamps would be lagging the applied voltage 150 volt by an angle phi and the voltage VR which is nothing but the voltage across the resistor is in phase with the current since it's a resistor and that is 120 volts the voltage across the inductor would in, would uh, lead the applied current by an angle of 90 degrees and that is shown as VL from this we will be able to uh, come to the conclusion that the voltage the source voltage is nothing but the uh, root mean square of the voltage across the resistor and the voltage across the inductor so we follow the parallelogram law of vector addition over here and so if we substitute the available data the available data is the voltage source voltage 150 volt and the voltage across the resistance is 120 volts so we find that the voltage across the inductor is 90 volts now the inductive reactance of this inductor is nothing but the voltage across the inductor divided by the current and voltage across the inductor has already been found out which is 90 volts and the current is 120 milliampere as you found out over here and we get the value of the inductive reactance as 750 ohm now from the inductive reactance and the value of the frequency of the circuit we will be able to find out the value of the inductance L so 500 L which is nothing but omega L is equal to 750 ohms and the value of L is obtained as 1.5 Henry if we were to see the options given we have 1.5 Henry as the option D and this will be the correct answer now let us see the 12th question the 12th question is which one of the following bridges will be used for measurement of very low resistance they have given us four options they have given us Kelvin's bridge Maxwell's bridge Wheatstone's bridge and Hayes bridge now the right answer is Kelvin's bridge we'll just see some salient features of this Kelvin's bridge now I have drawn over here the Kelvin's bridge it is also called as Kelvin's double bridge because it has two ratio arms over here I have drawn Wheatstone's bridge 
this is a very common circuit and most of us might be familiar with this Wheatstone's bridge it is very simple to analyze it has a ratio arm and these two resistors P and Q form the two resistors in the ratio arm and they have the it has the the Wheatstone's bridge has the standard arm the R is the unknown resistor and S is the standard resistor and here we have the uh, source of EMF and we can derive the value of the unknown resistor as P by Q into S. S is nothing but the standard resistor. Now P by Q is a ratio so it is that is why it is called as a ratio arm. Now in if we were to use a normal Wheatstone's bridge for measuring a very low resistance the problem is that the the resistance of the connecting leads so some leads would be used for connecting these this uh, the unknown resistor and the standard resistor so the resistance of these leads would in fact cause a serious error in the case of medium value resistors this would not be a very serious error but if you were to use uh, this bridge for measuring low resistance low resistance generally means uh, less than resistors less than 1 ohm so if we were to use it for such a purpose we will find that this uh, resistance of the connecting leads would uh, produce a serious error so in order to overcome this in Kelvin's double bridge they use two ratio arms two ratio arms would be there and because there are two ratio arms the bridge becomes uh, the error the error produced due to the resistance of the connecting leads would be negligible when these ratios are same when P by Q is uh, equal to this P by Q when both these ratios are same the resistance R of the connecting leads this is the resistance R of the connecting leads would not affect the uh, measurement so here also uh, as in the case of Wheatstone's bridge the expression for the unknown resistor R is given by P by Q into S so one thing we always have to keep in mind is that this uh, both these ratio arms would have the same ratio at the time of balance uh, in order to make this uh, bridge insensitive to the uh, to the kind of resistance of the connecting leads so we'll go back to our options and this is the correct answer which is Kelvin's bridge. Now we will see in the 13th question. The question is for what value of k are the two block diagrams as shown above equivalent. They have given us two block diagrams. We will analyze these two block diagrams and try to find out the solution. So these are the two block diagrams which they have given. So in this second block diagram, uh, the system used is that of a feed forward. This is not a feedback but a feed forward because there is a transfer of direct transfer of signal from the input to the output. And we will analyze this second block diagram in detail. Now what I have done over here is that I have multiplied these two gain blocks. We can call them gain blocks also. This is in fact a transfer function. This is also a transfer function. We can multiply both of them since both of them are in cascade. And when we multiply them we get what is over the expression over here k divided by s plus 1. Now the output c of s can be expressed as r of s into this transfer function plus the r of s which comes over here so this summation over here is represented as a plus sign over here so this is the expression for the output c of s now we can simplify this this r of s can be taken over to the left hand side and from this we get this expression C of s the net transfer function between C of s and R of s is nothing but s plus k plus 1 divided by s plus 1. So that has already been given in the first block diagram. So this is equivalent to 
this block diagram. So that is S plus 2 divided by S plus 1. Now by comparison of these two terms, we will be able to make out that the k plus 1 term is equal to 2 and hence k is equal to 1. If we were to see the answers given, the value of k is what they have asked us. So we have got through our solution the answer that k is equal to 1. So this, this option is the correct option. We will now see the 14th question. The 14th question they have asked, consider the following, the rise time, settling time, delay time, peak time. They have given us four parameters and they have asked us what is the correct sequence of the time domain specification of a second order system in the ascending order of the values. Now we will see all these four parameters in detail. I have drawn over here the response of a standard second order system to a unit step response. The system is under damped. So and I have marked over here the various times associated with this response and the first parameter we see is the delay time and the delay time is defined as the time taken by the response to reach 50% of the final steady state value. Now the since the input is 1 and since we have considered a standard second order system, the final steady state value also will be 1. The system is under damped. So over here I have marked the delay time. Now the next time parameter that we will be seeing is the rise time. The rise time in the case of an under damped system is defined as the time taken for the response to reach the 100 percentage of the final steady state value for the first time. So we can see over here that the response reaches 100 percentage of the final steady state value that is 1 for the first time over here. This 1 is crossed several times in the response. So we consider only the first time it crosses 1. So that is the rise time. Next parameter we will be seeing is the peak time. Now peak time corresponds to the maximum value of the response. The maximum value of the response is over here. This is also called as the overshoot, peak overshoot. Now the time corresponding to this would be the peak time. The next parameter is the settling time and the settling time is the time taken for the response to settle within plus or minus 2 percentage of the final steady state value. So it has to settle within this band and the time at which this settling happens is the settling time. Now a different band also might be defined plus or minus 5 percentage but normally the settling time is defined with respect to this plus or minus 2 percentage band. Now from this T axis you will be able to see that the order of magnitude of this different timings. So we can see that the settling time is having the highest value, then comes the peak time, then comes the rise time, and then comes the delay time. So we have arranged over here the various times and the corresponding codes have been written over here and they have asked us to arrange it in the increasing ascending or the increasing order and the answer to that is the option D. Option D is the correct answer. The 2, the settling time has the high, corresponds to the highest value and the delay time corresponds to the smallest value. 
So D is the correct answer for this question. Let us now see the 15th question. The 15th question they have asked the oscilloscope has an input capacitance of 50 picofarad and a resistance of 2 mega ohm and the voltage divider ratio K of 10. What are the parameters of a high impedance probe? In the four options they have provided they have given the resistance and capacitance of the high impedance probe R1 and C1. We will now analyze this question in detail. The given parameters of this question are the capacitance of the oscilloscope, the input capacitance the input resistance of the oscilloscope that which is nothing but 2 mega ohm the input capacitance has been given as 50 picofarad and the voltage divider ratio has been given as 10 what they have asked us is the capacitance and resistance of the high impedance probe over here I have drawn the equivalent circuit of the high impedance probe oscilloscope combination the C1 and R1 have been drawn over here representing the capacitance and resistance of the high impedance probe and the CO and R0 which are the input capacitance and resistance of the oscilloscope have been drawn over here now the input is applied at this terminal between this terminal and the ground and the output is taken from this terminal and the ground now with regard to this question I will be defining a voltage divider ratio this will be different from this one and that is nothing but the Z0 divided by Z0 plus Z1 Z0 is the parallel combination of these two impedances and Z1 is nothing but the parallel combination of these two impedances so this is nothing equivalent to nothing but the reciprocal of the given voltage divider ratio that is 1 by K an aspect we have to remember in this case is that in order to make this voltage divider independent of the frequency of the input signal it is the ratio the ratio of R1 by R0 should always be equal to C0 by C1 this can be proven through a lengthy derivation but I have just written it the final result over here it can be proven easily now this it is very important to make this voltage divider ratio independent of frequency because otherwise the voltage divider ratio would change depending upon the input signal that is applied to the oscilloscope this variation in voltage divider ratio mainly comes on account of the presence of these capacitors had there not been these capacitors the voltage divider ratio would have been just dependent upon these two resistors and it would have been independent of the frequency now with this result in hand now we can consider that a DC input is applied to this voltage divider and since the this ratio is always kept true this the derivations that we are doing would be applicable to other frequencies also so with DC input V0 by VI would be equal to R0 divided by R0 plus R1 that is equal to 1 by K equal to 1 by 10 and we can substitute the value for R0 which has already been given to us and from that we get the value of R1 as 18 mega ohms and we can consider this expression and in this expression the values of R1, 
R0 and C0 can be substituted to find out the value of C1 and it has been obtained as 5.55 picofarad. Now if we were to consider the options, here we have R1 equal to 18 mega ohm and C1 equal to 5.55 picofarad. So the correct option would be the option B.